Well, good morning or evening, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, I'm Nick Quint. I am the New Testament theologist guy on YouTube. Uh, welcome to my attempt at a YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, let's get this thing going. Uh, just a brief recap. If you haven't watched the previous series on entire sanctification, I covered already a few different topics. One is on the idea of Jesus's words and how we might even do theology. You know, so we start with the Sermon on the Mount. And then the next episode was focused on the Christology of Paul and John and a little bit of Hebrews, if I recall correctly. So we looked at those uh, authors and how they thought about Jesus and that uh, how it relates to the idea of sinlessness as it relates to Jesus and how they conceived of Jesus and how that might kind of impact how we think about entire sanctification as a theological doctrine. And then the other episode, I looked at the uh, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, pneumatology, and argued that part of what the Spirit does is involved in sanctification, and that means that the Spirit is involved in empowering us to participate in the life of Christ as we are conformed to the image of Christ, or the image of our Creator, as Colossians 3 says. And so what the Spirit does, just by way of recap, uh, and of course I would go and watch those videos before watching this one, uh, just so you can get a little more flesh up on the bones of what we're talking about here. But in essence, the spirit is involved in our sanctification, and that involves transformation and participation. So just by way of recap, this episode, we're going to focus on kind of the meat of the, uh, the biblical case for uh, entire sanctification. We're not going to cover every single passage. That's what my book is for. And my book itself is far too short and uh, all of that sort of stuff. But for the sake of this video and keeping things short and, and uh, nuanced enough, I'm going to be covering a few basic texts. And so rather than begin with the Gospel of John or the book of Revelation or Hebrews or James, uh, I'm not leaving them out of the equation, but the book and my uh, research interests and uh, passion is on Pauline theology. And so we're going to stick with Paul for today. But I think that's fair because outside of uh, the synoptic gospels and the synoptic tradition, I would argue Paul is probably the most prolific defender of entire sanctification as conceived of theologically. So uh, we'll stick with Paul for this one. And so uh, just a quick read, uh, just some uh, flotsam and jetsam, some kind of ideas. Uh, I believe Paul wrote all of the uh, epistles attributed to him uh, with varying degrees of certainty on that point, but I think Paul wrote everything. That doesn't mean there are aren't uh, interpolations or glosses or textual issues in his epistles that need to be dealt with. I'm certainly uh, in agreement that there are some of those, or at least there appear to be. And that's, of course, with varying degrees of certainty and confidence. Um, but uh, all of Paul's letters, I think, are profitable for this. And we'll see most of the literature or most of the, the proof texts, or at least the, the, the biblical texts, are found in the undisputed Paulines. Uh, that's not to say they aren't found in other texts, uh, but we look at Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Corinthians. And so without further ado, let's hop into this because this is why we're all here to study scripture and to be conformed to the image of Christ through sound theology and through learning to love Jesus through his word. So let us look at this real quick and boom. All right, cool. So that's a little image. And before I get, uh, keep going, uh, if you wouldn't mind subscribing and sharing this and encouraging other people to subscribe and share this, that's the only real way any YouTuber gains any sort of traction. So if you are interested and you haven't subscribed, just click subscribe, ding the little bell uh, and go put that on all and you'll get everything I put out. I'll put out at this rate, probably one or two, maybe three videos a week, depending on how late my son sleeps. He's currently asleep right now. It is 12.35 in the morning, uh, Sunday morning. So, and you already know what I'm gonna say, go to church in the morning, or if whenever this goes out, probably Sunday afternoon, um, I hope you went to church, but it's never too late to go to church in a COVID era. Uh, you can always get on the internet and watch your uh, watch the sermon from your pastor, so. But yeah, uh, that's the only way any YouTube channel grows. So thank you for that. And so this is, we'll start with what I might call an, an embarrassing, embar embarrassingly brief primer on Pauline theology. 
And so just a few basic points. Uh, Paul's conception of God is predicated upon his understanding that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's bedrock New Testament theology. That's where you start. Hence, the resurrection of Jesus drives all of Pauline theology, and I would argue all of New Testament theology. You can't talk anything, you can't talk about anything theological or even historical in the New Testament if you don't start with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's bedrock principle number one. And I would argue also the telos of the new, the new community of faith, the ecclesia or the church, the gathering of believers, is to live into this new reality where the resurrected son of God is proclaimed as king and lord or king slash lord over all things. And so we are beginning with not only that God raised Jesus from the dead, but Jesus is lord of all things. And in light of that, those two kind of ideas, uh, our journey as a new people under a new king might be called a journey into holiness or sanctification. And then the question arises for this video, how are we to be conformed to the image of our creator? What does Paul say uh, we are to do? And how are we to be perfect in Christ? And so we'll kind of begin and go from there. And so this is from my book. Uh, I can't remember. I think it's page 47. And I quote, uh, I quote my book throughout, um, just copying and pasting, although I won't just read it or anything like that. That's boring. Um, what I think is so interesting that Paul will use language like renewal or transformation, or uh, the most famous line is new creation. If anyone is in Christ, new creation, if you, if you render the Greek literally. That's almost as if Paul is just exuberant and jumping up and down about all of that. It's, it's actually a wonderful passage. Uh, what makes these sort of diverse lexemes or, or experiences unique and complex is that Paul's language of that renewal language uh, tells us that perfection, uh, as biblically defined, includes or impacts, I would say, the totality of the human person, all that we are, and especially that include her mind, you know, Ephesians 4, 23, noose, mind, or, or mind-centered, you know, that kind of thing, brain, you know, uh, and the entire person is included in this renewal. It's not just, you know, my fingernails are suddenly perfected. It's like, no, the whole person is involved in this. There's a bodiliness. As Jesus Christ was raised bodily from the dead, so too uh, perfection impacts us bodily as well. And uh, I would argue the process of sanctification, or we would say probably the, the, the conclusion of, of sanctification, that would be Christian perfection, is rarely, if ever, instantaneous. Now, I'm not denying that the Spirit could do that. I know maybe of one instance where I've seen something radical like that. But by and large, it's a journey into entire sanctification, a journey that can uh, culminate in this life, but it is not the guarantee, nor is it even the purpose per se. Although I would argue to be fully conformed to the image of Christ means you are entirely sanctified. You know, sin is no longer a thing that you dwell on or participate in, just as a point. And so that is why uh, that is why we do not lose heart. But even if our outer humanity is being utterly corrupted, yet our innerness is being renewed day by day. And that's Second Corinthians four. I love when it does that. Second Corinthians four. Second uh, Corinthians four sixteen. And therefore, we would say the transforming power of the gift of Christ, that is Ephesians four seven, affects the totality of the human person in her lived in her life lived in faithful pursuit of God's vocation for her, what God intends for us to be as not only persons within the body of Christ, but as the whole creation is impacted by the resurrection of Christ. Um, this also brings up the idea of image, the image of God. You know, Christ is the image of the uh, unseen God. And that's, of course, Coloss uh, Colossians 1.15 and following in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And this is, and we're basically called to be brothers and sisters in this, a family. Uh, and we would, just by way of, of making this point more uh, explicit, the human person is in desperate need of emancipation or liberation, apolutrosin in Greek, you know, and that emancipation or liberation includes her whole person, uh, the emancipation of our bodies in Romans 8.23. That's kind of the big text. So it's not we are set free from our bodies in some sort of Gnostic cosmological anthropological dualism where Casper the ghost is flittering around in heaven. That's not biblical anthropology at all. Uh, we're rather, our bodies themselves are liberated or set free from the decay and bondage of sin, evil, and death. And so uh, just kind of a brief primer on kind of Paul's other Paul's kind of theological conception of God and Christ and how that also impacts our uh, journey into entire holiness. 
And so uh, Paul's apocalyptic kind of scheme or vision, uh, and there we'll look at four main texts today. That's 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Colossians 1, 28, Philippians 3, uh, that should be 12 through 15, uh, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And there are other texts I would argue at least imply it, Romans 12, 1 through 2, um, uh, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, which implies that we're holy and without blemish because that's what sacrifices are if we take the Old Testament backgrounds uh, seriously there. And also um, the gift of the Gentiles being entirely sanctified or, or sanctified or made holy by the Holy Spirit in Romans 15, 16, which I think has kind of an implicit kind of echo or idea of entire sanctification there. But those are more implied. I'm not arguing that they explicitly teach it, but we, uh, you know, you can draw a uh, theological conclusions from reasoned inferences. So I would say that. And then also you have Titus uh, 2, 11 through 14, which is a classic text that people argue teaches both uh, universal atonement and prevenient grace. And I would argue uh, the language of cleansing perhaps implies a form of entire sanctification there. Uh, but we won't talk about those entirely. If you have questions about that, write them in the comments below and I'll try and get to them. And so uh, we're going through my translation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I have a master's degree in New Testament studies from Fuller Theological Seminary. So, um, and I got, and I did really well in my Greek classes and my uh, exegetical classes. Most, all of my exegetical classes were in Paul. Um, not to, I'm not tooting my own horn, but just saying I, I know a thing or two. I'm not perfect, I make mistakes, but you know, I, I know Greek and can translate it. So, um, and this is uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And Paul is writing, this is at the end of a long discourse that something is an interpolation. Uh, I don't think, I don't find the evidence for that compelling, but it's essentially using cultic language and being pure and all that sort of stuff, being kind of set apart, set, up, set apart, wow, being set apart from evil and sinful deeds and even some persons. And uh, Paul says, because we have these promises, beloved ones, we should purify ourselves from all defilements of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness, epiteliontes, um, sorry, I didn't, I haven't looked at this in a, for a second, hagiosunen, hagiosunen, yeah, uh, in reverence for God or fear of God. And so you, you can tell I'm a normal human being because I butcher Greek just like everyone else. And so just some kind of exegetical points on that passage. We should purify ourselves. And this is uh, an action done by us and which affirms kind of our agency in the sanctification process. I'm hesitant to use the language of free will, although I think it's appropriate when, you know, when we're having the discussion, but it seems to suggest some sort of willful participation in what God is doing for us and on our behalf. Excuse me. And the active tense form of the subjunctive uh, would imply um, you should cleanse yourself or purify yourself when combined with the reflexive hiatos yourself, you know, um, cleanse yourself makes that clear that there is agency involved as it relates to, sorry, there we go, relates to the human person's participation in uh, entire in, in, in terms of holiness. And uh, they are, we are called to sanctify ourselves from anything that defiles us. Um, and so that's a clear command. Uh, and the, the, te the participle, the act, and that's perfecting right here. So the active tense form of the participle epiteliontes um, confirms uh, confirms the opposite. Wow. All right. I, yeah, I butchered that. In the scheme of kind of, and Paul kind of operates with an already not yet. The kingdom of God is broken in and is breaking in, but hasn't fully broken in. That's kind of the idea. Um, this perfection is actualized dramatically with the notion of, we might say, a completed process that will ultimately be accomplished over time. So the active tense form means it is happening right now. The, the action uh, is taking place as we kind of, as we, well, as we're reading it, it's already taken place in the life of the uh, Corinthian community. But if we read it for ourselves, is taking place, not continuously as in forever, but is presently ongoing. Uh, but it has, I would argue, a telos, a point that is fixed. And the fact that we are told to sanct or purify or cleanse ourselves implies that there will come to a point, we will come to a point where that's no longer necessary. Uh, because Christ has already done that essentially for us. You know, Christ is the great high priest, as Hebrews talks about, has made, uh, made cleansing for sin or atonement for sin. And this is not just a, and so I think this, uh, I wouldn't say teaches explicitly, although I think it's a reasonable conclusion. And this is also a major proof text. Uh, and I use the term proof text neutrally. Um, I think you can have bad proof texts and good proof texts, but it's a proof text that I'm exegeting. I'm not just throwing it out there. 
Um, this is also read in the early church in some sense, kind of laying the seeds of entire sanctification. And John, and I, the references are in my book. Uh, John Chrysostom talks about, quote, the fear or reverence of God being the means by which holy, quote, holiness may be perfected, may be completed and fully um, actualized, we would say completed or fully actualized. And so that's uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, perfect, where we are told to be perfecting holiness in reverence for God. Um, and if you are continually involved in the fear of Christ and perfecting yourself through the process of purification, um, there will, I imagine, come a time where that is no longer necessary because of what Christ has done for us. And so I think this implies entire sanctification, and I think it's a reasoned uh, conclusion drawn. And so here's another one, uh, Colossians 1.28. Uh, Him, that is Christ, we proclaim, warning all people and teaching all people in all wisdom, so that we might present all people as perfect, teleon, in Christ. So people as perfect in Christ. Some translations render it as mature. Um, I think that's true, but it doesn't say enough for reasons that I'll show. So just a little bit of context. Uh, Revelation is a key point here where Christ is the image of the unseen God in a chat in verse 15 previously. Um, he makes, and this is making the word of God fully known, and that's part of Paul's mission. Uh, mystery is kind of the thing that the hidden one from before the foundation of the cosmos has been revealed or manifested for us. So we now have an object of faith, an object of and I use the term object uh, positively. I'm not saying Christ is an object, but now we have a, a person of faith lived for us. So now that we can see what faith looks like, so we can imitate and participate in that faith life. Um, and then the next bit of context is what we would call the hope of glory, uh, which is a great phrase, the hope of glory, in which we might say uh, the complete power of God, Christ in us in verse 27. So that's a little bit of context to give us some, some sense of the passage. And so uh, the big debate, I would argue, comes down to how you define perfect, teleon, right? And this axiom can refer to maturity or completedness, um, but there's, I think, an ethical component because Paul is talking about warning and teaching people uh, in wisdom. Wisdom is not merely just head knowledge. Wisdom for Paul uh, in, a, in, a, in, in many of his uh, discourses is centered specifically on how you live your life, what you do as an embodied creature, how you renew your mind, how you purify yourself or cleanse yourself in holiness and reverence for God, right? Wisdom is part of that process. And the whole purpose of Paul's mission, uh, and of course, and I think and to get to that point, but the point right before that, the Colossian church once was a certain way hostile and, and, and kind of angry at God and, and enemies and, so, and stuff like that, but they've been reconciled. And that's the whole point in verses 19, 20, 21, and 22. Um, but God has reconciled all things, including the uh, uh, Colossian, the Colossi church, back to Christ or through Christ, even in some instances, in some instances. And so we've got this beautiful way of kind of saying you were once this thing in this state of existence or sphere of influence, but no longer are you defined by that. And now Paul, of course, will warn the Colossian church not to fall away or not to do all this other stuff, which implies that some can fall away. Entire sanctification or Christian perfection is not the same as once saved or always saved or once saved and always saved or um, the tulip doctrine, perseverance of the saints. It, it, uh, it's not one of those things. You can give that up. Uh, while having had it. Um, and that's uh, a testament to the corrosive nature of sin. Um, but once you reach entire sanctification, um, the perp or rather the point then becomes uh, being perfectly united to Christ means you will not uh, fall away from that. Um, and it's, that's one of those questions I still have. Uh, I'm still thinking through, can you lose your perfection, you know? And um, I would say, I think, and I, I may have contradicted myself just now, but kind of rethinking as I talk, I think there is a sense in which, yes, you can lose it, but losing your, uh, falling back into sin is not the same as not being a Christian or losing your uh, your faith or anything like that. But we'll, we'll get into that in, another, in a later video where we talk about kind of practical issues and I answer some objections. Um, but we want to talk about the text. And so the final bit here is, the mission for Paul is to present every reconciled person as complete or perfect in the wisdom of Christ. So having the full knowledge of who Christ is, what Christ has done, and being embodied creatures who live into that calling. Um, 
the purpose or the telos of all of this is perfect unity in Christ with no sin and with complete reverence for God. That is the goal. And so there is a teleological ethic or purpose to how this is all being worked out. And it is through the resurrected son of God. And so again, Colossians 1.28 may not say everything about entire sanctification, but it certainly has enough seeds that where we can see the beginning of this tree, to, uh, this theological or doctrinal tree, uh, we can see it beginning to flourish and grow. And here's another one I think is interesting because it implies a lot and it also challenges. So it's, it's both an affirming or confirming text, but also a challenging text, I think, in some sense. So let's read it. This is Philippians chapter 3, verses 15, uh, 12 through 15. Uh, not that I have already attained this or have been perfected, you know, teleao, you know, that, that verb again, or that lexeme, but I pursue it to take it for myself, and that it is perfected, or it is contingent upon perfected in the previous clause, which that clause is contingent on the previous section on faith in Christ and stuff like that. But those that does form a rhetorical link there. Uh, upon whom even I was obtained by Christ. So Christ has kind of claimed Paul for himself. Uh, that doesn't mean Paul can't not claim Christ. I think Paul implies that. But the point is on the is the emphasis on what Christ has done for Paul and for us by extension. Brothers and sisters, I myself do not regard this as having been obtained. This Again, referencing that perfection, which implies all the other stuff that came before. But one thing I know is that I am forgetting what is behind and straining for what lies ahead, uh, which is teleological, at least in some sense. You know, there's a purpose or a goal towards he's going. And he even says, I pursue towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many of us that are perfect, teleoi, uh, the ones who have been perfected or are perfect, let us have this mindset and if you think differently about anything, God will unveil that to you also. So which is, which is interesting. Essentially, Paul is saying, not that you don't have the capacity to know, but that God will reveal, which implies you should be in prayer. You should be reading God's word. You should be involved in the local church. You should be uh, in reverence and in activity and worshiping, like culmin, uh, cultivating a transformed mind and stuff like that. So spiritual life is meant to be active, which is why I hope you went to church today. So just some exegetical points. Uh, the context is uh, Christomorphic, which you can thank Dr. Logan Williams, uh, one of, I don't know if we're friends, but I hope we're friends. Logan is, is uh, we both went to undergrad, not necessarily together. He was there before I was, but a brilliant thinker, brilliant theologian, just one of the scary smartest guys I, I'll ever know. I, I hope I can be half as smart and cool as he is. Um, crystalmorphic, being, um, being I, I, you would argue, formed or conformed into Christ. And that's in the famous Christ hymn in chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 11. And that's, of course, in Philippians. Um, and we're to have the same mindset of Christ. So remember, you hear that word mindset, way of thinking, way of being, way of acting. That's what that means, a way of being, thinking, and acting. And then there's the issue of suffering in the previous uh, few verses, in verses 10 through 11 in chapter 3. Paul is seeking after the work of Christ for the purpose of righteousness, but it also involves the giving up of things, counting all things as loss or as uh, a naughty word. That I, I can't say because my son may watch this someday and I don't need it. I don't need, I don't need him seeing this. Daddy, what does that word mean? He's probably already heard it sadly once or twice from me. Um, yeah, he's being honest. Uh, but righteousness is also the other component, which is Paul is already participating in God's good character and calling for his life, which makes sense because it is kind of already and not yet, or we would say the not yet and already that's being worked out and still being worked out and has been worked out. So it's kind of a both hand there. And so um, Paul's own perfection is that kind of not yet already. In verse 12, not that I've already attained this or have been perfected, but I pursue it to take it for myself upon whom I was even obtained by Christ. So as Christ has obtained Paul, he's seeking to obtain this uh, state of reality. And that's reinforced in verse 14. And verse 15 may seem to contradict Paul's point. Um, Therefore, as many of us that are perfect, let us have this mindset. And if you think differently about anything, God will unveil that to you. I don't think he's actually contradicting himself. I think the point is, is a both and. Um, striving for something means in some sense for Paul, having already kind of having your fingertips on it, your, your fingertips are against it, but you don't have it fully in your possession, right? Um, it's like, you're reaching, I'm reaching for this mic. I'm not going to do that. I'm reaching for something. I can touch it or maybe it's, here we go. 
It is a wonderful dark beer. I have the glass, or in this case, I have a glass with a little bit. So I have it in my hand, but it is not in my mouth yet. So it's an already in my hand, but not yet in my mouth. That's kind of the idea. And I think Paul is getting at the idea of the nexus of holiness in Christ is something he is already participating in. So in some sense, he is already participating in perfection, having sought after it and seeking after it and having been obtained by Christ, but still waiting to grasp it fully for himself. And so it is an already both and not yet. Um, and I think Paul believed he was and was being perfected, which uh, this text implies. Uh, so it, it may pose a challenge, but I think if we read it carefully, the text is actually affirming the doctrine of entire sanctification as something to be sought after, but, but also something that can happen because some of them already happen. If we go back just a sec, uh, as many of us that are perfect, which implies that there are some folks that are already um, involved in perfect union with Christ, right? And they're probably some of Paul's, co Paul's co-workers as well. So um, Philippians 3, 12 through 15, I think, uh, is a more explicit text on this subject that implies strongly that entire sanctification is the goal of the Christian life. And Paul is also viewing himself as involved in the pursuit of that through Christ and with Christ. And this is, I think, the best text for it. And this is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And may he, the God of peace, sanctify you entirely. Hagiasai uh, haloteles, haloteles. And may your whole alacleron, yeah, ala, or halacleron, yeah, I got to get the H in there, halacleron, uh, spirit and person and body be preserved as blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so just some flotsam and jetsam kind of comments. Uh, there's a hopoxylgamina adjective here. The, the haloteles is a compound of halos, whole or all. That's language we find uh, in the Johanni Corpus. Uh, I believe it's in uh, 1 John 2, 2, where it talks about um, the whole world. Christ died for the whole world, the sins of the whole world. And telos, the goal or end or perfect, or in some cases tax. You know, telos meaning a tax of some sort. That's how it's used in Romans 13 which is itself an interesting text that we will not talk about. Um, but the important kind of context of this verse is that in the previous section, uh, Paul explicitly calls people to keep away from every form of evil in verse 22. And hence, I think the whole issue of entire sanctification centers on the rejection of sin in 1 Thessalonians 2.10. And so here, um, keeping away from every form of evil allows God to sanctify you wholly at your whole person. And going back to that point that I made at the very beginning, the renewal of your mind, the noose in Ephesians 4, 23, right? So it all comes back to that, that God is working that point out for us and with us for the goal of our full sanctification in Christ. And Paul uses the verb, you know, to sanctify. And that, I think that reflects the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, you might say in some sense it was Paul's Bible, or at least Paul's concordance, if we want to be snarky about it. It's not quite his, Ma quite his Matthew Henry collection or his John Gill collection, not even close, but, you know, he, he certainly used the Septuagint quite, quite, quite often, uh, and it uses the term to refer to the, the sanctification of a holy mountain, or dedication even, you might say, or a place of sacred architecture in Exodus and Second Chronicles, uh, of an animal sacrifice in Exodus 29, a couple places. And even with respect to God, God is the one who sanctifies or is God is the one who has is holy, you know. Uh, in First Ezra 1.3, uh, uh, a, a non-canonical work of historical importance, speaks of temple servants uh, sanctifying themselves before God as well, which is kind of similar to uh, this idea of Paul uh, in Second Corinthians, uh, as we saw in Second Corinthians 7.1 and also here being sanctified or set apart or cleansed from sin and iniquity and evil, as Paul has already said. And John, and so I think this text tells us that God plans and is doing this thing where he is going to sanctify us entirely or perfectly. Um, and that means the expulsion of sin in our lives by our rejection of sin in our lives. And Paul, and uh, Wesley points out the word, and I think he's referring to the uh, the halateles, right? Um, the word signifies holy and perfectly, H -O, uh, W H O L L Y, holy and perfectly, every part and all that concerns you, all that is of or about you. The whole person is sanctified by God 
in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I think uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 is probably the most explicit text outside of uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 43 through 48, where um, the God of peace, so not a God of enmity or a God of sin or a God of anything like that, God of peace, sanctify you entirely or wholly all of you and may your whole spirit and body and person or person and body be preserved as blameless which is without sin in the coming of our lord jesus christ or at the coming of our lord jesus christ so this happens before it may be just right before but it is seem to suggest that this is before the coming of our, or the piracy of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ at the apocalyptic turn of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of all things, which is a great eschatological point, which we'll talk about eschatology and perfection in one, two videos from now, because next video, well, we'll talk about the next video. But, and so we've looked at the exegesis. And so sin, kind of a, a now and a not then, a now and a not then. And we would say, and kind of conclusion, the temporal reality of sin and the struggle against evil does not mitigate the call toward entire sanctification. You can have sin now and not have sin then. You can have sin now, but but and you will not have sin then or sin not then. I don't know if that makes sense. Rather, the call is intensified as we respond through the work of the Holy Spirit against sin with the goal of being united fully to Christ in holy love. The intense struggle of sanctification is a progression into the apocalyptic unknown, because I don't think any of us have known what it is to not sin, which is the whole point of how radical this is, that we are called to live into the sinless life of Jesus Christ through faith, where the Spirit of God is active and moving despite any restrictions we may place upon the Spirit. And holiness essentially is God's weapon to wield against what enslaves us, enslaves humanity, and it is Paul's call to holiness, and Paul's call to holiness is a call to arms, theologically. And so just some summation, uh, and I, this is the same point as previously in the previous video, but I think it's important. Uh, there's two basic theological axioms here. The Holy Spirit will lead us into liberation and light in life and truth. By cooperating with the Holy Spirit, we can be sanctified in spirit and in truth. Uh, Paul affirmed the doctrine of entire sanctification, and this is seen, I would argue, most clearly in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and also in Philippians 3, 12 through 15, Colossians 1.28, and 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And his belief, that is Paul's belief in the preexistence and sinlessness of Jesus Christ and on the ab abiding power and sovereign goodness of the Holy Spirit also testified to the doctrine of, an, of Christian perfection. And so uh, I hope that this case is compelling to you. Uh, I'm of the opinion you should never change your mind very quickly. Uh, if you have any questions or insights or comments, put them below and I will try and get to them. Uh, no guarantees. But I think there's so much to this doctrine practically, theologically, and biblically, and I'd like to see it come back to life. And I'm not saying my, my book or my, my work here is the final word at all. I'm, I know there's more competent scholars and theologians and historians that are doing work on this right now. There's a guy I, I want to say is at Candler School of Theology that has a book coming out that I'm really excited to read. And I hope it um, really goes beyond my book. My book was very limited in scope, unfortunately, but that was by design. And so next video, we'll be talking about uh, how sex and marriage and perfection work together. And that's actually a theme that Paul talks about in Ephesians 5. And so uh, wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives and all that sort of stuff. So we'll be talking about that, which I think is very interesting. And uh, for those that know me, uh, know you probably won't be surprised by where I go, but I hope you'll be surprised by how I get there. And then the video after that, uh, if we go by the book, will be on eschatology, heaven, hell, uh, all that sort of stuff and how perfection and uh, entire sanctification and all that works together with eschatology. So this is not just a doctrine that doesn't impact anything else. Rather, it is a, uh, a, a doctrine that has profound implications for other doctrines. And so if we're doing biblical theology or systematic theology or constructive theology, everything touches everything else. And so that is what's coming up in the next, I don't want to put a time stamp on it, but coming up soon-ish in the next several videos. 
Uh, thank you for watching this. Uh, subscribe and share this video and like this video. Um, if you liked it or blessed by it, please comment and tell me. Like I, I, I don't know if you liked it or not. Um, I'd be very, I'd be very blessed to see if you liked it or, or you found it helpful, or if it challenged you. Uh, like I said, don't change your mind too quickly. Examine the scriptures, think about it, pray about it, and above all, um, uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May His face shine upon you and. Uh, I hope you enjoyed church tomorrow, and I hope you went to church tomorrow, and I hope you learned something and you enjoyed your worship time. And that is my son moving. Let's see, and he looks like he's gonna stay asleep, which is cool, because I still have dishes to do, and I don't want him waking up. Uh, yeah, but may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. God bless, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks again.